Okay, thank you. Okay, let's uh, get it started. Uh, sorry for the technical <laughs> so I get started. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Stephen Lewis here at BCU in connection with his PhD thesis, The Science of uh, Hestia. So, uh, well, uh, Stephen is very well known. He doesn't really need introduction. So, uh, Stephen is really indeed one of the pioneers, I would say, in file systems, in computer network systems. Uh, in optimization and control. Uh, Stephen uh, uh, got his PhD actually in Berkeley in 1992, and now he is Dylan Foster of Intuitive and Mathematical Sciences Department, also the Nutritional Engineering Department at Caltech. Uh, Stephen is the senior editor of IEEE Transaction and People of, Net uh, People of Network Systems and IEEE Transaction of Network Sciences and Innovation. So uh, thank you, Stephen, for coming. And the stage is yours. And yeah, uh, the whole presentation uh, with question and answer, we will take one hour. Okay. And it's up to you to allow people to discuss you and okay. the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Tala. Thanks for the invitation. It's great um, to be in Denmark uh, presenting for the first time. So feel free to ask any questions uh, throughout the presentation. So it's worked by former PhD student Yi Jie Tang in collaboration uh, with Emiliano at UC Boulder and also Andre uh, at NREL. So this is mainly Yi Jie Tang's thesis work. Uh, I will start with the motivation, uh, which is optimal power flow problems, uh, but the theory is more general. It's about time varying optimizations uh, and with applications uh, to OPF. So I will start with a very brief motivation uh, where we consider a static problem, which is well known, and how do we deal with uh, non-convexity. There are many ways to deal with non-convexity, and I will just present briefly one way to just set the stage for static OPF and why we need time-varying optimization for non-convex problems. And now I'll present two of Yi Jie Tang's uh, thesis results. One is the first-order tracking algorithm. So at a high level, the problem is that each time t is, it can be a discrete time, you have an OPF, you have some constraint optimization. Now, if you can solve the problem to optimality for each time, then it's just a static problem. So each time t, you solve a static problem to optimality, then you apply the control. The issue that we want to address is if you don't have time to solve the problem to optimality at each time, you can only, let's say in the extreme case, do one gradient step, and then the problem changes for the next time step, and you do one gradient step, the problem changes, and so on. And therefore, how do we track the optimal solution as the problem changes? So I'll present a first order algorithm and then the error bound that you get derived for the first order algorithm. And then I do the same for the second order algorithm and the trade off between the two. Then I will just show you some simple simulations to show that at least in some situations, the scheme can work very well. Hopefully I will have time for the last five or 10 minutes. I will do an advertisement for an, another project which is completely unrelated, but uh, I hope interesting. All right, so, so OPF. I guess people here all know about OPF. It's extremely important. And the reason it is so fundamental is because it really underlies numerous power system applications and planning problems. So we solve them around the world hourly, daily, in real time, and so on. There's a huge literature on OPF since 1962 when it was first formulated. And there are different models people use. Um, AC power flow, which is nonlinear power flow, DC, which is a specific type of linearized model, and other approximation models, and so on. So roughly, it is a constraint optimization where we want to minimize a certain cost subject to two sets of constraints. One is power flow equations, so nonlinear inequality, uh, equality constraints, for example. And then some operational constraints, which could be bus constraints, or which can be more uh, complicated than that. But roughly, uh, there is two sets of constraints, one for the power flow equations, one for some operational constraints. Depending on the application, there can be a more different types of constraints, or even binary variables, and so on. But it's constraint optimization, that's optimal power flow. The two features that we will focus on, one is time varying nature, which we'll see more uh, in detail later on, and the other is non-convexity due to the power flow, the, the power flow equations. So um, 
this. So this is a form um, of OPF. Uh, if you recognize this, then you know what it is. Otherwise, it's not that important. I'll just point out some feature. Uh, the, let's say you have a power network with n buses. Then V is a complex vector, n-dimensional vector, where VI is a complex number that represents the voltage phasor at bus I. Small SI or SJ is the power injection, again complex, due and reactive power injection at bus J, and L is a line flow on link JK. And therefore, the, the, the main feature of this is that you can formulate an OPF in this format where you minimize a certain cost, which is quadratic in the voltage vector. So V is a column vector, complex column vector. VH is the transpose Hermitian or, or Hermitian transpose. So you, you do the transpose, take the complex conjugate. And therefore, uh, this VVH is really a REN1 matrix. It's an N by N matrix, right? um, um, so is, which is quadratic in the voltage vector. This is a powerful equation, so you can exp which represents the power balance at each bus J. So the net injection as uh, bus J is a function of, again, VVH. So YJ depends on the emissions matrix, one for each J. It represents the topology and impedances in the networks and so on. You can also express line flow in terms of the voltage vector, and then this is some injection limits. So if in bus J, on bus J there's a generator, then there will be generation capacity, for example. So again, these are complex numbers. So the inequal each inequality really represents two, one for real power, one for imaginary power. And this is the line limit, and this is the voltage uh, magnitude limits. So the problem, so this is a very simple form of OPF. Again, in practice, depending on your applications, you could have many more variables and constraints, security constraints, and even binary variables, and so on. So the problem in this formulation uh, is difficult because the matrix YJ is that describes the network topology impedances uh, are not, uh, are not um, Hermitian. It's not uh, positive semi-definite. So, um, right, okay. So um, this is a general formulation. And it includes, for example, if some of the loads on the buses are fixed. So these are the parameters, not optimization variable. Then you simply set the lower bound and upper bound to be the same value, and that fixes SJ to be a parameter. Right? And therefore, we're going to use the voltage vector for the entire network and dimensional vector, the injections and the line uh, flows to be optimization variables in general, even though some of the components can be just, uh, just uh, parameters. Um, it's non-convex because YJ, one for each bus J, um, it's not permission, it's not positive semi-definite, and that's why this is non-convex. And this is a um, famous picture from Yin Hisken that shows for the very simple three bus problem, if you formulate the OPF, if you project to uh, two, verb, two of those variables, or three of those variables, then the feasible set is this really beautiful, ugly uh, region, service, that's the feasible set, that's the non-convex. And, and therefore, Computation is really uh, difficult. And there are many ways people deal with non-convexity. You can linearize it, and DC approximation is one particular linearization. You could do semi-definite relaxation, you could do QC relaxations, and strong SOCP relaxation, um, and so on. So the semi-definite relaxation is the standard trick where this is a, if you eliminate, um, if you eliminate the injections and also the line flows um, to, to from the equal, using the equality constraints, then you can express everything only in terms of voltage vector. And therefore the problem can be reduced to this form where the variables are the voltage vectors, uh, and then this is the um, this is OPF. So this is quadratic constraint, quadratic program, um, and it's non-convex. Uh, and a simple observation is that everywhere the variable voltage appears, it appears as this quadratic form VVH, which is, again, a REN1 matrix. And therefore, you can equivalently write this problem instead of in terms of voltage vector in terms of W. So everywhere you see VVH, it is replaced by a new variable, which is N by N matrix W. And the important 
feature of this transformation is that even though this is quadratic in the variable voltage vector V, this is linear in W. So the Kirchhoff loss is linear in the new variable W, um, and then uh, it's not any n by n matrix, but it has to be positive semi-definite and also rem one. So the two problems are equivalent in the sense if we solve this problem, which is convex, you get optimal matrix W, then you can recover an optimal solution for the original problem, except for, uh, for a, a shift um, angle. Here, the only non-convexity is REM1, and therefore the approach is simply to ignore uh, this, this um, simply ignore this REM constraint and solve a convex problem. Then once you get an optimal solution, W optimal, then you check whether it has REM1. If it does have a REM1, then you're done. You can recover an optimal solution for the original non-convex problem. But if you solve the relaxation without REM constraint, you get an optimal solution which is not REM1. Then you are stuck. It's not very clear what an optimal solution of relaxation that is not REM1 tells us. So we can do heuristic things. We can, from the non-REM1 optimal W, we can extract a voltage vector which will not be feasible because it won't satisfy the Kirchhoff laws. But you can use that as your starting point and run some local algorithm and hope to converge. So there are heuristics one can do, and empirically it seems to work very well, but there's very little thing we can, we can, we can guarantee. So in summary, this is the, the relaxation. The idea is that uh, instead of solving this problem where the feasible set is non-convex, which is hard to deal with, we solve a different problem where the feasible set is convex, is lived in a convex uh, space. And then you hope that the optimal solution here has REM1. Okay, so things you can prove is that let's say if you have a network which has a tree topology, say the radio network, then it turns out you don't have to solve SVP, which is computationally quite intensive. So for large-scale network, it is still not, not very um, practical. But if the network is radio, then you can solve SOCP, which is much simpler, orders of magnitude faster. Uh, uh, and therefore, for radio network, you can always solve SOCP. And the reason we care about radio network is because almost all distribution systems um, are radio networks. And a lot of the smart grid innovations will appear first in distribution systems. So for radio networks, then, uh, there are sufficient co conditions that will guarantee about the problem data. They will guarantee if you solve SOCP, you will always work. That is, you will always get an optimal solution from the SOCP from which you can extract an optimal solution for your original non-convex OPF. So the sufficient conditions that people have developed, um, there are three types. One are sufficient conditions that have to do with the injection bounds, so the power injection bounds. Uh, the second type would be that the voltage upper bounds will not be tight at the optimal point, and there's some other technical conditions. But the essential feature is that the voltage upper bounds cannot be tight for uh, the second type of sufficient conditions. And the third has to do with the phase angle bounds. The phase angle bounds need to satisfy certain conditions. So if any one of those three types of conditions is satisfied, then SOCP is guaranteed to work for your radio network problem. So let me just show you, uh, to give you a concrete idea, one of these, uh, the first type. So the, for the first type, the condition looks like the following. So in general, QCQP, of which OPF is, is, is an instance, takes the form where you minimize some quadratic function in the voltage uh, in, in um, uh, n-dimensional vector. It can be real, it can be com complex. Um, subject to the quadratic constraint, uh, that looks like this. And therefore, QCQP is specified by a constraint matrix C and uh, the, the cost matrix C and the, constraint, the set of constraint matrices C, CK, one for each K, one for each constraint. There are also real numbers BK that are part of the problem, but the sufficient condition doesn't depend on BK. So it's, 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 it's sufficient, not, not necessary. So if we have a uh, such QCQP specified by this set of matrices, but the underlying network is a graph. Then you can show that um, uh, 
if this sufficient condition is satisfied, uh, then SOCP realization is exact. So what this condition says is the following. We look at each line ij, so that uh, um, bus i and j are connected. For each line ij, you have a cost matrix cij, which is a complex number. And for each constraint matrix, ck of ij, each of which is a complex number. So if you have capital K constraints, then for each line ij, there are k plus one complex numbers. The amenities are not important, so you can plot them on the unit circle. So the condition says that if all of those k plus one complex numbers lies on one side of the unit circle, then SOCP restation will be exact. So this has the implications on the injection bound. So you can translate that to OPF. What does that mean? It has something to do with the injection bounds. Some cannot be tight and so on. Uh, but that's the type of conditions one can prove for radio networks. So unfortunately for a mesh network, uh, there's no general condition. There are, there are sufficient conditions for very special types of mesh networks, but not general uh, mesh networks. So this is a picture that shows what happened uh, when a realization is tight. And this is actually for a mesh network, um, for a three bus mesh network. When you project to certain uh, variables, so P1, P2 are the real powers at bus one and bus two. The feasible set is this black line, which is non-convex. When you do SDP realization, you are enlarging the feasible set to be the purple region that contains the black line. And it turns out that um, the two have the same boundary on this end. When you do SOCP realization, it's the yellow region, which turns out to strictly contain the purple region. So again, it's a mesh network. And therefore, even though we, we don't have sufficient condition, empirically, very often, when you run SDP realization, even for mesh network, often the optimal matrix will have run one. So what happened in this case is that the, uh, the cost function goes like this. Um, and it's when you minimize the cost over the purple region, you're going to get a point that is on this uh, boundary. And that boundary turns out to be on the black line. And therefore, when you solve the relaxation, the optimal solution turns out to be feasible and therefore optimal for your original problem. Now, if you blow up this region, the yellow region strictly contains the purple region. And therefore, if you do SOCP relaxation, you're going to get a point at the boundary of the yellow region, which is not on the black curve, and therefore, it's not feasible. And therefore, SOCP relaxation for this mesh network is not exact. So that's uh, what happened pictorially. Yes. Um, so you said there's no uh, proven sufficient condition for injection of the CVDP for relaxation? For mesh network, for, for general mesh network. For general mesh network. Yeah. But on the CVDP as far as I know. On yeah. the, on the graph you showed here, it looks like there's equal relaxation from the convex hull of this feasible space. Is that's that something right. that is observed generally in practice? Whether it is observed generally in practice, there, there seems to be a lot of uh, evidence. Yeah. Um, there's, as far as I know, I don't think there's any proof that's always the case. Okay. There are also certain counterexamples where the SDP realization, at least in some region, is not a convex hull. Um, yeah. Okay. So the, the, the mesh network seems on the one hand, it seems complicated because there's no analytical result. On the other hand, as you alluded to, empirically, things seem to work very well. And therefore, it's not very clear is it a hard problem or not a hard problem. Uh, so people have proved it's MP hard formally, um, but in practice, it seems to work well. So uh, it'd be nice to, be, to have a theory on, on clarify all these things. So right now, there's a lot of empirical uh, understandings but there's no theory. And you, this counterexample where it's on very shaky on network or also on very normal conditions of operation? Uh, I think they are not that peculiar. So Dan Mosen that, uh, at Georgia Tech, so he has all kinds of different uh, examples where you get these strange um, feasible sets that can be disconnected, it's certainly non convex and all that. And, the, and then if you change different parameters, you get different uh, 
different behaviors of the feasible set from which you can probably create uh, different scenarios. All right, so, so there's some simulations from uh, Elon Bittai corner that shows, at least in some examples, uh, the savings between solving realization and get optimal solution uh, versus, say, um, local algorithm can be significant. Okay, so uh, that's static OPF. Again, the applications that we have in mind is that at each time t is a discrete time, you have an OPF, and if you can solve it to optimality each time, then you just solve static problem, that's fine. Um, but sometimes you may not have enough time uh, to solve to optimality, and therefore the issue is how, how well can you track. So here's one example where you, you, you want to do this mobile control, where you control the reactive output of smart inverters, for example, to help stabilize the network voltage. Uh, you can formulate this in OPF. It looks something like this. If you look at, for example, one bus I, then this is the net injection on bus I. So this is a real power injection, reactive power injection as a function of the voltages, uh, voltages in the network. So in this example, for the, uh, the solar power PI can be a parameter. So you can measure in real time. And in fact, uh, there are applications and we have those data as well, where you get the so on-site solar generation in real time, which you can use to control. So this will be a parameter rather than optimization variable. The uh, background low for on-site, let's say for your building, you can also get um, in real time. And therefore, these are parameters. They change over time. So that's the point. The optimization variables in this application will be two. One is the reactive power at the um, smart inverters. The other ones are the voltages in the network. Both are optimization variables for your problem even though in practice, we only directly control this. So the hope is that we solve this problem, we get the optimal um, reactive power injection, we apply to the network. The network is then going to solve power flow equations and get the voltages. The hope is that if my model is exactly the physical reality, then the voltage that got realized in the network will be the same as what I computed. Otherwise, hopefully it's close. Right? So, but again, to this problem, both are optimization variables. So here's another example, EV charging, where you want to do real-time optimization of EV charging, which is what we do at, at Caltech, if I have time to talk about that at the end, um, to minimize the demand charge, for example. Again, you can formulate that as an OPF problem. Um, here, the building load, net load, will be parameters, which we actually get in real time. And the optimization variables will be the EV power, the charging power, which is real, for all commercial products today, the reactive power is just zero, even though the power electronics will actually allow you to optimize that as well. And then the voltage uh, vectors, those are the optimization variables. So again, in this example, the problem is time varying, each time t. So in our case at Caltech, we solve a QP every minute. So each time t is one minute. Each time t, you formulate a problem, you solve it. So for our case, um, for the simple case that we're doing now, we can actually solve up to optimality. But you can imagine if you have large number of garages on the feeder and if you have big, um, uh, a large problem, you may not be able to solve it uh, to optimality. Right? So that's the, the motivation for real-time OPF. And therefore, we think in the future, uncertainty will continue to increase. Real-time real -time measurements will become increasingly available. And therefore, at least for some applications, it makes sense to close the loop. And therefore, we have to deal with real-time um, or time-varying optimization problems. Yes? So at each time, you oh, coupling across time. Mm -hmm. So right now, we don't consider that. There certainly can be, for example, if you have a storage, mm -hmm. right? So right now, uh, the theory doesn't consider that, but that's a, a very important direction. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, let, me, let me describe the, the formulation uh, EJ has in his thesis in collaboration with Emiliano and Andre. Okay, so the formulation that EJ uses is you minimize a certain cost and there are two types of cost functions. One is smooth, C of X, which depends on time, uh, is smooth, uh, positively non-convex. The other function, H, 
is convex but positive non-smooth. And then inequality constraints and equality constraints, they can be, they can be um, non-convex but smooth. And there are also oops, sorry, many other people who have done uh, work in this area. Okay, so let's look at the simplest example where um, the, there's no non-smooth part of the cost. So everything's smooth. Let's say everything's convex. So you get the simple convex problem where the equality constraint is linear, right? So you get a convex problem. You can write down the KKT, right? So it's a standard KKT condition. You have stationarity. Lambda is the vector of Lagrange multipliers associated with inequality constraints. And mu is the Lagrange multipliers associated with the um, equality constraints. So you have stationarity, your primal feasibility and complementary slackness for the inequality constraint, and then you have primal feasibility, right? So standard KKT. If um, H is non-smooth, but is simply the indicator function of some feasible set, capital X, that is time varying, XT, right? Then this problem is simply, you, H becomes additional constraint that X has to be in that time varying feasible set X. Again, for this problem, you can write down the KKT. Um, same three types. You have stationarity in terms of the normal cone of the feasible set capital XT uh, evaluated at the optimal point small XT, small XRT. You have feasibility and complementary slackness, which looks like this, again, in terms of normal cone, and then feasibility. So in general, you can write down the KKT condition for this non convex problem. There's no guarantee that solution or a point that's set by KKT condition is globally optimal or locally optimal even. But our goal is to track such a KKT trajectory over time. Right? The hope is that the trajectory that we track is at least a local optimal. Right? Um, so that's the goal. Okay, so let me summarize the result before I get to the, uh, to the details. Um, the key issue is how well can we track if we cannot solve the problem each time to optimality. So we can do a few iterations each time. Let's say in the extreme case, we just do one iteration. Right? So one gradient step, and then the problem changes. We do another gradient step, the problem changes, and so on. Right? And the question is how well can you track? How do you track it, and, and then can you prove error bound? So uh, what Eugene and, and his collaborator proved is that uh, the two so they, they looked at two types of algorithms. One is the first order algorithm, which is very simple, as you will see. Um, but you need dual regularization to help tracking. But the dual regularization also introduced some error. So there's a trade-off. And then there's, there's also a class of second order algorithm, which is faster and therefore can track better. But it, is, it involves more computation per time t. Right? So you, we'll see that. And then for each type, uh, you get derived the bound on the tracking error. So I've defined exactly what is tracking error and, and, and the bound. And now I'll show you some simulations. Okay, so a little bit more detail. In terms of performance for first order algorithm, it's, it's a proximal primal dual algorithm, but with dual regularization. So we'll see the detail in a moment. And again, the idea is that the regularization enhance the strict concavity in the dual variable, and that speed up the tracking. And, and he was able to derive a bound on tracking error in terms roughly of three things, three types of things. One is the how fast the problem changes in terms of how fast the primal and dual variable, the optimal primal and dual variable h time t changes from t minus one to t. So Z is the primal verb and the dual verb, so it's x star minus star and mu star. Um, the second component is the some degree of nonlinearity of the functions and therefore non-convexity. It is a complicated expression in terms of the parameters of the problem, but roughly uh, it is a measure of how nonlinear the problem is. And the third is as I mentioned earlier, that some error, again, some explicit expression in terms of prime parameters, but it's a measure of the error due to the dual regularization. Right? 
So we see that bound in terms of these three types of things. For well, second algorithm, uh, the idea is that you, for each time t, you solve a quasi-Newton uh, problem. And the, uh, and the basic idea is that you, you, you look at this, um, the cost function, which has a smooth part and non-smooth part. You approximate the smooth part by a quadratic function, which is, again, the smooth part can be non-convex, but you appro uh, approximate by a quadratic function, convex quadratic function, uh, with approximate Hessian. And therefore, you solve a QP, convex QP, at each time t. It's more involved computationally, but for your problem, it may be doable. And then he bounds the tracking error, again, in terms of how fast the KKT point shifts, uh, some error that measures the approximation, quadratic approximation, including the approximation of the Hessian, and then the error due to zero regularization. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more detail. Um, okay, so this is the first order algorithm, problem with algorithm. Let's start with the simplest special case. The simpler case, there's no non-smooth part. Um, you write down a Lagrangian, so it's a standard Lagrangian, it's the objective function of the primal problem. The uh, Lagrange multiplier lambda times the inequality constraint and the mu times the inequality constraint, the standard Lagrangian. The primal dual algorithm is simply you minimize the prime, uh, over the primal variable in the negative direction of the Lagrangian with respect to the primal variable. Alpha is a scalar that is step size. And then the dual variable, you simply uh, maximize over the dual variable. So you move in the positive direction of the Lagrangian uh, with the step size, which is eta times alpha. Okay? So eta and alpha are just step sizes, scalar. Okay? So that's the standard primal dual algorithm. Now, uh, so this is first order that typically is too slow. Uh, it also doesn't allow non-smooth costs. So let's just add the non-smooth non costs. So that's the general case. Um, you form the Lagrangian as before, this is a standard Lagrangian, but now you add a dual regularization. That makes the Lagrangian, the regularized Lagrangian, strictly concave in lambda and mu. That helps uh, tracking. And then you, for, to take care of the non-smooth part, you just do the uh, proximal operator. So for example, if h is the indicator function we saw before, then this simply means that you do what you did before, and then you project to the feasible set x. Right? So that, that's what it is. Um, the other ones are the same, even though the exact expression when you take the derivative will be different, because now you have this uh, uh, regularization, the expressions are different, but the principle is the same. Right? So it's pretty uh, standard proximal primal dual algorithm. So the tracking error is this, so this is Everything with a star means that if at time t or tau, so discrete time is tau, if it, at time tau you solve the problem to optimality, uh, well, you, at least you get a KKT point. You get a KKT point, then a star is the primal variable, lambda star, mu star, the dual variable for that KKT point. Right? Uh, then this is the uh, tracking, so z hat will be the corresponding variables from the algorithm. So you look at the control error. Uh, so then you can have a bound on those error bound in terms of delta z star, which is the how fast the problem changes from time tau minus one to tau in terms of the KKT point. Think of KKT point z star as the optimal point. Right? Uh, if everything is convex, then it's an optimal point. Then how much does the optimal point moves from one time period to the next? The worst case, max over tau, right? So that's how far the problem changes. Um, so the bound is that, suppose there's, um, there's some delta which really is a bound on the initial error. So in time period one, Z1 star is, think of it as the optimal point, so it's the KKT point, so that's where we want to go at tau one, z zero hat is my initial point. And therefore, this is simply the initial error. The second condition roughly says that if the problem doesn't change very fast, the dual regularization error is not that huge. 
meaning that the sum of them is dominated by the initial error delta. And this term, which is a measure of how non-convex problem is. So again, the rho is some explicit expression in terms of the parameters of the algorithm. It's some complicated expression, but it really measures how nonlinear the problems the problem is. So if this holds, then EJ proves that asymptotically the control error has this very simple form. Two terms, one depends on how fast the problem change, changes, and the second term is the dual error that's introduced in, in regularization. So this is asymptotic uh, 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 bound on the error. Yes? So the row will be less between zero and one. Mm -hmm. I guess the question is that if the problem is convex, will it um, Not very clear. And the reason is the reason is the row is, uh, that you just derived is quite complicated. It's not very clear if the problem is convex whether the row uh, will approach zero. The hope is that you will, but because the, the derivation is of approximations, it's not very clear that you will. The hope is that it does. Um, but he actually, his result is, right, oh, okay, because of, of this condition that the temporal fluctuation and the dual error is dominated by this term, this is also less than this simple expression. But again, the, the idea is the same. The, those, those three parameters, how fast the problem changes, uh, the non-convexity, and also uh, dual error that determines the bound. So his result is actually um, non-asymptotic. Uh, so there is a term for every tau, time tau, there's this term, but rho tau tends to zero the asymptotically. Okay, so that's the first order, the second order algorithm. Okay. So let's start with a simple case where it's unconstrained and it's smooth. Um, so in that case, the standard thing is to write down the KKT condition, which is simply the gradient equals zero. And then the Newton algorithm is to move in the negative direction of the gradient, scaled by some approximation of the Hessian, or inverse of the Hessian. So if B is exact Hessian, then this is a Newton algorithm. So this is a standard Newton algorithm, and the idea behind this algorithm uh, is very simple. That at each point, say x hat tau minus one, this is where I am now, at the beginning of time tau, I approximate the cost at this point by the quadratic function. So that's the idea. And therefore, I have a quadratic problem, convex, I can solve it exactly. And therefore, if you approximate the cost function by this quadratic function with an approximate Hessian, you minimize unconstrained, you minimize this quadratic function, then the minimizer is this. So that's the idea behind this Newton algorithm. If the problem is smooth, unconstrained. If the problem is not smooth, you would do essentially the same thing. So the problem is not smooth now, but it's still unconstrained because it's not which looks like this, this is a sub-differential of H. It's, H is convex, so, uh, you call. And therefore, you do the same thing. This is exactly what we had before. You approximate the smooth component of your cost by the quadratic function with an approximate Hessian. And then you add the non-smooth part. This is convex. This is convex. It's unconstrained. In principle, we're going to solve it. What kind of costs are convex in uh, reality? I guess if, non -smooth, I mean. oh, non-smooth. So for example, I want to say the, uh, the, the feasible set is some capital X 
that varies over time. So, in, so I could have h as the indicator function of this feasible set, which will be the same as if you just add additional constraint that small x is in capital X. Right. I think the most common uh, form of this is going to be additional constraints uh, that's not expressed in terms of inequality and inequality constraints. Um, but you're right. In practice, uh, right, I can't think of anything that you cannot express in, not in terms of equality and inequality constraints. Uh, Maybe here's some example. Thank you. I'm sure the other applications, it just, <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, but in general, if you have non-smooth cost, but it has to be convex in this case. So in that case, at each time t, you just get a quadratic, convex quadratic problem, you solve it. And therefore, it involves more computation than the first order. In the first order, you just do a simple computation. Here, you will solve a quadratic program. But you, again, you can solve it. Um, and the goal is to track a KKT trajectory right, using this algorithm, x, uh, x hat. So the tracking error, again, is the, um, so, so in, this, in this version is the, um, uh, just the primal. W is any weighting matrix. W can be identity matrix, for example. Otherwise, any positive definite matrix. So it's a weighted error on the primal. So you can bound it in terms of a few things, a similar idea. One is how fast the problem drifts. Now, because we're only dealing with the prime, it's non and unconstrained, so it's only primal variable, and therefore it is in terms of the prime, optimal primal variable, or KKT point. The second parameter in the bound is that you can think of these two numbers as lower upper bound of your approximating Hessian. So um, if W equals identity, um, or, or, or if, let's say if the approximating Hessian is a constant and equals to the weighting matrix W for all tau, then these two are just one. Otherwise, this is some kind of a upper bound and lower bound on the approximating Hessian. Okay. So, and then the third is, is this expression. What this expression says is the following. If the quadratic approximation of your function is good, if the approximate Hessian is good, then this parameter rho is small. And therefore, rho is the measure of the error of your approximation, both due to your function may not be quadratic, but you are approximating it with uh, a quadratic. And also in terms of how good the, uh, the, the, the Hessian approximation is. So these are the parameters that will go into the bound. And the bound looks like the following. So if rho is less than one, then uh, uh, the asymptotically, the error bound depends on how fast the problem changes, which is this sigma. Um, this rho, which is how good your approximate, uh, quadratic approximation is. And then uh, this lower upper bound on your Hessian. So it's like a condition number of your Hessian or condition number of your approximate Hessian. So again, in a special case, if the approximating Hessian is constant and equals the weighting matrix W, then this is just one. Then you get this simple expression. Uh, again, he derived a bound which is not asymptotic. You have a component that goes to zero geometrically uh, in time tau. Okay, so that is a special case when it is unconstrained. 
Now if we add the constraint, then the idea is that you write, again, you can write on the KKT condition, and there are two approaches. And the goal is to track a KKT trajectory. Right? The first approach is simply uh, to remove the constraint and make it a penalty. Right? So you can define a penalty function if the constraints uh, if the constraints are violated, then you have a penalty. And then you form the unconstrained problem with the penalty. Right? So it's the original cost, C and H, plus the penalty, appropriately scaled. Then you get an unconstrained problem. You just use the previous theory. You can, uh, you can apply the tracking algorithm and the error bounds for the unconstrained case. That's the first approach. The second approach, um, Again, it's a primal dual approach. So you can approximate the smooth part, which is this, of the cost function by a quadratic, and then you add the non-smooth part. Okay. Uh, and then you add the dual regularization, like what we did in the first order algorithm. Um, ah, you, 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 you add the, um, uh, you, you add the regularization, okay. Then, in each iteration, you solve this min max problem. So it's a primal dual on your convex quadratic algorithm, uh, convex quadratic problem. Again, it's more computationally intensive than first order algorithm, but it's convex, it's quadratic. In principle, we can just solve it. Um, the solution of this is what you apply to the network at each time tau. Uh, then you can do the analysis. Uh, you will get the error bound that has a similar form, but the exact expressions are different. Uh, you, you have a second order, so the Lagrangian will be different, it's approximate uh, quadratics. So you can derive all of this. Uh, the ex exact expressions, again, are different, but they all have similar form, which is very nice. Okay, let me almost done. Let me show you um... uh, a simulation. So it's a 37 bus, but you get the 18 PV systems. So these are the time varying parameters. So these are the loads that are time varying, and also the solar generation that are time varying. Sometimes you have these sharp variations. This is a cost function. This is a, uh, a mobile control smart inverter application. So the variables are the real and reactive power outputs at the smart inverters. So these are the constraints that characterizes your inverter. So you can solve um, that using the first order algorithm. This shows the control error. So z hat minus z star uh, over time. So you can see that when, this, when there were sharp changes in the parameters, uh, your control error suffers. Uh, but the average, the time average of the error is pretty small, about 1%, seems reasonable. Uh, this is first order, so there's, uh, so there's no hard constraint. It's a primal dual algorithm. And therefore, the voltages may be violated. So this shows how bad the voltages can be. Uh, it seems reasonable. Um, again, you could have sharp error bounds or vo voltage violations when there were very sharp changes, which means that you should just tighten your bound. Um, the time average error uh, is this is, sorry, this is an error. It's 0 0.1%, not, not 0.1 per unit. It's 0 0.1% per unit. So the average uh, error or, uh, or the multiple violation uh, seems to be small. That's the first order. Second order, so you implemented this particular type of second order and runs on simulations using I2A 300 buses. So the previous plot shows you the control error. This shows you the cost, the difference in cost. So uh, one of the, there are two curves over time. One curve illustrates the actual optimal, uh, or at least uh, the cost at the KKT point, which is f of x star, and the other curve is the cost of the algorithm. So basically, you cannot differentiate between the two. So they tracks very well. If you look at the difference, the difference between these two costs, it looks something like this. Very small, basically, uh, less than 1%. Okay. So I will be done in, let me give you an advertisement on the, on the last little project, completely unrelated. Um, so we have uh, implemented a 
EV charging facility at Caltech and one of the garages at Caltech. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the infrastructure and then we'll tell you a, a, a new project that we uh, just recently started. So uh, it's one of the garages at Caltech. Uh, we, we built uh, two transformers uh, here and with two panels and so on. Each one is 150 kilowatt transformers and then connect to uh, the, there are now about 80 level two chargers that we control in real time. There's also a DC fast charger right now, we don't control it. So you, the smart chargers can, um, so they are capable of real time measurement, communication, computing, and control. And therefore what we do is that every minute, we solve a QP, it's a convex QP. So we solve a QP, that tells us exact charging rate in terms of currents for each of the EV. And then you do this for the next uh, minute and so on. Um, so the, this is the garage, there's a controller in the garage when you plug in the car, there's a mobile app you can use to tell the system how much energy you need. I need 30 miles or, or, or 30 kilometers. And when do I expect to leave? So the system knows this information and then you can form the optimization problem, solve it, and so on. So those are done in the cloud. So there's a startup company now at, at Caltech for full disclosure, I'm a co-founder. Uh, so the startup company will solve those problems in the cloud and dispatch the command to the closure controller, which then control the chargers. So this, uh, this has been operating for the last three years. Uh, it has delivered 700 megawatt hours of electricity. It's about more than two million miles, uh, avoided 750 metric uh, tons uh, of CO2. Okay, so that's the garage. Uh, the SAR company also has um, deployed in many other places in the Bay Area and some in uh, LA area. Uh, and I will skip all the benefits of this versus uncontrolled and so on. Okay, so, and you, you, and you can prove some uh, analytical results uh, about the system. And so there's some deployments, uh, quite a bit of deployments in the Bay Area and so on. Okay, so the project that we are, ah, okay. So this is a picture of uh, the actual charging curve. So this is time, uh, this is current, the charging current. Uh, there are 60 cars maybe, so one, so 60 curve, one for each car. So you, you can show the actual charging uh, in real time. So you started. So we started to operate, but it's a, it was a prototype. We continue to improve and everything, but we started to operate February 2016. So you can see the um, the, the the steady increase in the usage. Um, the statistics that seems to be pretty consistent across multiple data sets uh, from us, but also from others. For example, typically each session. Um, uh, takes about six hours, it's a workplace, uh, but you typ they typically finish charging in two hours. Um, they will uh, deliver, for each session, delivers about 10 kilowatt hour. Yeah, so 10 kilowatt hour. Okay. So that seems to be quite consistent. Uh, with and without optimization, you can save capacity, infrastructure capacity, so transformers and conduits and cables and so on, um, three, between three to four times. So that's the benefit of, that's one major benefit of smart charging, not surprisingly. Right? If you optimize, you can save a lot of infrastructure. So for the, uh, for the facility at Caltech and JPR, it's three to four times, so significant. Okay, so the project that we recently started that we really wanted to tell you about is, is that we want to, Okay, so here's the motivation, <laughs> sorry, I'll get to that. So for people interested in algorithm research, like ourselves, we typically use models, math or simulation models which are pretty unrealistic because we don't have realistic data, we don't have realistic simulators, and we certainly don't have opportunity to field test our algorithm. Right? And the project that we are starting, uh, start, start now wants to change that. So we have this facility, which uh, is a commercial operation now, but we want to build an intermediate layer on top of this facility 
step would allow people to do smart grid research or EV charging or pricing research on top of these facilities. So the intermediate layer that we are building now has three components. One is ACN data. You automatically get the data from deployments um, of customers of the startup, clean them, anonymize them, and then make them available on the web um, to anyone that might want to be interested in the data. You may be interested because you are interested in EV charging. You may be interested because you have machine learning algorithm that you want to apply to some real data. The second component is ACN SIM that try to build a realistic simulator from the data. So it's data-driven simulator. So the simulator will have a model for the user, which we can learn from the, from, from the real data. It has a model for, of a battery, the model for the uh, charging, uh, and also the infrastructure at the garage. So we want to use the real data to, do, to create a data-driven but model-based simulator that we will also integrate with popular grid simulators, so grid FD or power, power, uh, map power, for example. And therefore, you can simulate not only within uh, one garage, you can also think about if you have a feeder with 20 garages, each doing some kind of optimization within each garage, what is the impact on the, on the grid, for example? Or how do you interact with the grid and provide DR services, uh, for example? And the third component is ACN Life, that if you have an EV charging algorithm or pricing algorithm that you have analyzed, you have simulated, it's all safe, that we can allow you to actually implement your algorithm on the real cars at, at Caltech. So this component that we're going to build, we haven't, um, we'll make sure the algorithm you want, want, the command you want to send, is safe, for example. Right. So, okay. Um, so that's the advertisement. Uh, it's available now. You just, we're starting. So take a look. If it, if, if it might be useful for your research, fantastic, use it. But um, be aware that we're starting, so there probably will be uh, hiccups and stuff. So in terms of status, the ACM data is available now. Um, there's, there's about 28,000 sessions now. It's growing at about 2,000 sessions per month. We're trying to recruit more of the startups' customers uh, to share the data through this. Uh, so we, we already get a couple that have agreed to, to, to share the data. So the, um, but right now it's Caltech and JPL. The, simula the simulator, now there's a very preliminary version uh, that we are testing. If you are interested, let us know. Uh, you can play with it. Um, but you will continue to be developed and, and, and uh, refined. And also you will be integrated with grid simulators. Uh, and then the ACM Life, uh, we, we haven't started. Uh, I think that's it. Right, okay. If it's useful for your research, great. If you even have ideas you want to implement on, on this, um, that research portal, fantastic. Let us know. Okay, thank you very much. That's right. Mm, is there some human parameter in the optimization that you can, because you have some knowledge about how fast this is changing, and maybe you could incorporate that in the, you know, in the optimization, the step size or whatever. Is that something that you're planning on your research? Is will make sense. We have not looked at that. Uh, so as you said, if we know how fast it changes, for example, maybe we can incorporate that information in. Maybe it's how we choose the step size and so on. We haven't looked at that yet. So right now the result is simply, given how fast it changes, which we cannot change, yeah. then the bound depends on that parameter. Yeah. I have a question, a question, but the panel didn't answer any of the, like, the main question. So if you have a question, you can ask it right now. No. Because, be, uh, so if we uh, dualize the constraint, and it's always transient, it's not an optimality. So could, could you get some bounds on how much you violate? Um, some of the, the 
Right. That's right. Um, uh, we have not looked at that. Whether it's possible to get some bound on that, might be. <laughs> I suppose we we'll start with a simple case, let's say convex case. The non-convex problem is, I'm amazed um, how much it has derived. It's, it's so quite complicated. Um, yeah, so maybe we can start with the convex case and see whether it's possible to have a bound on the violation. Yeah, so right now we don't have that. Right, so we assume we know those parameters, which in practice is not true and so on, so there's a robustness issue. But those parameters will appear in the bound. So the bound, the, 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 the thing that we have, like the row and the yield of these and so on, so those are explicit expressions of parameters of the network, the step size, um, parameter of the algorithms and so on. So they will appear in those, uh, in those expressions. Whether uh, one can say something about, let's say if your network has parameters that satisfy this condition, then the bound will be better or worse, we don't know. Presumably one can first analyze something along that line, but we haven't. Assume that one day we solve the OPS problem nicely and we like the price and, and, and we find the, the market interest and so on. So this uh, flow regularization is so nice, it makes the application function in the convex very nice. But at the end of the day, how we can interpret the economic flow? Specifically, if by choosing different values of epsilon, we may end up with different solutions or uh, if we can read a different epsilon for different, I don't know, terms, we may have problem. Do you have any idea into what? I mean, for economists, what this epsilon means? Yeah, not clear. So. Not, not clear. Yeah. Is there that, that, yeah, that's an interesting question. In, in power system, in that the Lagrange multipliers are actually very important. Those are prices that people care about. Yeah. Now, if you distort them for computational reasons, what does that mean economically? Yeah, yeah. The, I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, Good. yeah, it's a good question. Excellent. So, what what did um, would I say well, about? Also doesn't know. Uh, I yeah, know. maybe the optimization. Thank you very much Thank for for that. Very Thanks. Very maybe the the theory people, the optimization theory people, they may have something. But but this is clearly important economically. But maybe in economics, you never worry about this set of issues, so you don't worry about regularization. Whereas in computational. We worry about computation, but we don't worry about the, we don't use it for anything. <laughs> it's just uh, to compute an optimal solution. It comes up a lot when we look at distributed optimization. Yeah, this, yeah, but, right. There's also another, um, I mean, economics yeah. is slow, then. Yeah. And, and really, but you need to split the term. I was just wondering, uh, because we talk economics,